Well, good afternoon. Can you hear in the back? As long as you can hear and also see. Um, so a number of years ago, I was here uh, at the request of Jay Doherty, and uh, he's become my good friend. I was uh, in the house at the time and in the, the, the leadership role. And at the time, we had Governor Blagojevich. Uh, Emil Jones was the president of the Senate. Frank Watson was the minority leader in the Senate. I was in the house, and Mike Madigan was the speaker. And Jay said, before I came that day, he goes, you've got to tell us what it's like in a leaders meeting with Rod Blagojevich and Speaker Madigan and da 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 and all the other people. Thought long and hard about it. And um, it hit me as I was driving into the city club that day that there was only one way to, the only analogy I could think of was, and some of you were here so you've heard this, is reminded me of when I was growing up, my mom and dad are both from Alabama, we moved to Chicago in 1966, West Pullman, my mom's parents were still in Birmingham, Alabama, my dad's in Gadsden, Alabama, and we drove in the family station wagon to uh, Alabama, and you can imagine how much fun that was in the back of a station wagon on I-65 that, by the way, was not completed all the way. We got to about Gary, and the games began. And you all remember this. If you were in any car with your brothers or sisters, he looked at me, he touched me, he crossed the line, and that's kind of how it was in those leader meetings. And I, it was like, you can imagine Frank Watson leaning over and hitting Rod Blagojevich in the head and messing up his hair. And, uh, he was saying, Emil, take care of that. So one of the great things about those trips to Alabama, I, it was so bad for my dad. We would stop at Shoney's or Jerry's, whatever they were called. And you know, we'd do this in a day. My mom would be in the front seat. My dad drove the whole time. He would get to Shoney's and sit down and he would order a chocolate milkshake. I thought, that sounds really good. He would take that milkshake, though, and not drink it. And he would just put it on his forehead for like <laughs> Three minutes, I'm like, what the heck are you doing? And it occurred to me that he probably didn't enjoy that ride. So uh, I, I talk about, I mentioned that the story because it was fun that time. And, and, I, and I think maybe we, there's some analogies today. I think if these two fellows, my friends, were in a back seat of a car, you'd probably have Dan on the right seat on the back, Pat on the left. And I think one of the questions for us today as we start this discussion, is there a center seat anymore? And is there a center seat for the Republican Party? So what we're going to do today is we're going to start out with just a, an overview from both of them, both Dan and Pat, um, who are very passionate about where they stand, and I both are very, very bright individuals, as you know, and tell us where they think, uh, you know, we're, we're past the primary. as a contentious primary for both parties. We've had our organizational meetings. Uh, we're now six months out from uh, the uh, gubernatorial race and other statewide races and, of course, House and Senate races. And the question I'm going to ask both of them to get started, and I've said to them, take five to seven minutes on where do you think the Republican Party's going uh, in the next six months? What are our outlooks for the gubernatorial race and those other races that I mentioned? And uh, maybe beyond, where are we going as a party? We're going to focus primarily on the state, but of course, uh, it's inevitable we'll probably have some uh, discussion about uh, the National Party as well. So, Pat Brady, why don't you get started, and uh, what's your vision, and what do you think, uh, how, how does it look for the Republican Party as we move forward going into the, the election this fall? The short answer is good. But first of all, I want to thank everybody for being here today, because to me that shows a lot of faces out there. I probably know everyone here, as Dan does. Appreciate your concern for the Republican Party. And you're concerned for the state. If we don't, this is probably the largest group of Republicans downtown since Lincoln received his nomination in 1860. <laughs> so thank you, uh, and this is because this is what it's all about. But I also want to take just one second as a personal point of privilege to point out my kids back there. Three of the four: Patrick, Kelly, and Grace. Uh, they're all uh, thanks. Kelly's a political science major at San Diego State. Patrick's going to NY next year to uh, major in political science. Maeve is at Indiana University in international relations. And Grace wants to be an FBI agent only so she can get a gun. And <laughs> your mother's very proud of you, as am I. And thanks for being here. And thanks for being so engaged. But to answer your question, Tom, I think the future of the party in, in nationally in Illinois is a lot better than I thought it was going to be six months ago. But the reality is the only way we win nationally and the only way we win in Illinois is if we're unified. I can give you examples. In, in, in 2008, when Barack Obama won, and I was down here at the McCain campaign, and there were 200,000 people screaming for Barack Obama, the guy who had 76 days in the Senate before he became president, and this was going to be the greatest thing in the world, a lot of Republicans got unified, not because of that fact, but because of the policies. Obamacare, cash for clunkers, that stupid beer summit, all, all the nonsense that the Obama liberal agenda 
uh, put on us. And in 2008, we became very unified as Republicans. And look what's happened since then. We've won 960 legislative seats throughout the United States of America. We drew the maps in a lot of these states in the United States. Um, we um, picked up 12 governorships. And here in Illinois in 2010, Mark Kirk won Barack Obama's seat against Alexi Giannoulis. And a lot of people said he was a weak candidate. Alexi was not a weak candidate. He was actually an excellent candidate. He was very popular with the Democrats. He was the heir apparent to Barack Obama uh, at the time. And um, uh, so we've had, we've had big years when, when we are unified. Uh, give me another example. Uh, in 2006, remember the Peter Roskam race? Everybody thought Peter Rossman was going to lose. That was the worst year for Republicans in my lifetime. I remember watching or walking in the Kane County um, Swedish Days thing, and they have an elephant, or a, uh, not an elephant, uh, they have a, uh, an elephant, excuse me, the elephant was out there, and you could tell in the crowd that everybody in the crowd hated the Republican Party at that time. It was, it was the Iraq War, it was a bad economy, it was a terrible time, we had a disastrous election. But the Republicans in the state of Illinois united behind Peter Roskam to beat David Axelrod and Rahm Emanuel and they tried to put Tammy Duckworth in that seat. And the same thing happened here in, in, in 2010, as I just mentioned, in, in Illinois, when Mark Kirk won. I think we picked up nine seats in the House. Um, Bill Brady, um, and I remember in that primary, I think this is a good example of what we're dealing with. Now, Kirk, what was the 196 votes between you and Bill Brady? After that primary, um, and I actually, Bill Brady and I grew up together, very good friends, and have been friends since we were basically born. I did not support Bill Brady. I supported uh, Kirk Dillard. And we lost by 196 votes, but never during the course of that, wasn't even a recount, but the course they figured out who our nominee was going to be. Did you hear a bad word between Bill or Senator Dillard. The, the party was unified. We came close in 2010 in the governor's race. We're paying for it now. But we were unified, so we won. 2014, we're unified behind Governor Rauner. Unified as a party. And we win. The first time a Republican has won in the state previously held by a, a presidential, where the president came from, since 1892. Don't underestimate the impact of that victory uh, for almost four years ago. He won by five points against Pat Quinn, a guy that's on the ballot every year in a very, very difficult state to win. The point is, when we're unified, we win. In 2016, we picked up seats in the House and in the Senate, six seats in total, because we were unified behind those candidates. This is in a year when we had Donald Trump at the top of the ticket. Donald Trump lost this state by a million votes, and we still picked up six seats in the legislature because we were united and unified behind our candidates. So we, are you, I'm not sure, are you done? You want me to be done? Well, no, I just, I was, I didn't want to interrupt you. Go ahead. No, I'm not, I'm not quite done yet. All right. Here, here's All the right. thing. Go ahead. Because, you know, listen, I, listen, there's nobody that likes to joke and mess around more than I do, but no, I'm, I de I'm dead serious yeah, about this. Yeah, I wasn't this. joking. We are at, at no, I'm, I'm kind of a kid. We're, we're at a crisis stage here in this state, in this party. If we don't win this election uh, come, uh, next fall, as a Republican party, we're going to be like New York and we're going to be uh, uh, like New Jersey and California. Some of those states, that, that, not New, uh, excuse me, not New Jersey, but uh, California, New York, states where the Republican Party doesn't matter. Now, people make fun of the Republican Party. They did it when I was a chairman that were irrelevant. We were very relevant. But if we lose this race, and if we're not unified and we lose this race, we're in big trouble. And the Democrats know it because they have aligned themselves behind probably the worst candidate right now in the country running for governor as a Democrat. The oppo book on J.B. Pritzker is eight volumes thick. Everybody knows it, but the Democrats don't like what Republicans stand for. They don't like reform. They don't like the, our tax policy. They don't like term limits. They want to keep the status quo. And if we don't unify as a party, and everybody in this room, and get behind our candidate, Governor Rauner, we will not win, and this state will not be a place where we can live. I'm done, Tom. All right. All right. <laughs> Dan, Dan, let me... Dan, let me just throw one thing in there to kind of, not, not to piggyback, but we, as we also move into this year, the importance of this election, I think, is, is, as Pat said, is, is huge, but you also have redistricting coming up, as, as you well know, redrawing district lines, so I think it adds a little bit more uh, to, the, to, the, to the discussion. So what do you, where do you see the party going in the next six months for all the things that, we, that I articulated earlier? Well, it's interesting. I mean, Pat brings up the progress that was made during Obama's eight years at the state level. Republicans control uh, supermajority of governor's mansions, supermajority of state legislatures. Certainly true in the Midwest. I mean, except Illinois. 
And so a little bit of a history lesson here. Because for 50 years, the Republican Party in this state has said, the way we beat them is join them. It started with Dick, Ogilvie's, uh, Dick Ogilvie, a Republican governor, giving us the state income tax. And then just to, you can take that if you need to. Uh, and, then, and then in the 80s, when the Reagan revolution was visited upon the country, 40 states in 80, 49 states in 84, the Reagan revolution didn't come to Illinois. Because Jim Thompson and the Republican center of gravity during the 80s, under Jim Thompson, was a big government deal making distribute the spoils of war party. And frankly, under Governor Edgar, even though he was a teetotaler and more personally disciplined, uh, he was an extension of what we had in the 80s. He was a caretaker who gave us terrible public policies, for example, tax increase, for example, the pension ramp. Then George Ryan, how did that work out? <laughs> and then after George Ryan's demise, 15 years about in the wilderness until Bruce Rauner came along. But uh, meanwhile, the entire time, we're in the minority in the House, the super minority through much of it, minus that two-year interregnum, 95 to 97. By the way, I was on House Republican staff under Lee Daniels during that time, so I know a little bit about what I'm talking about. I'm not just uh, you know, kind of a philosopher on the sidelines. I've been an activist. I've been in the meetings. I'm a participant. Mm -hmm. So then, George Ryan, terrible candidates for statewide office. Judy Bartopink in 2006 gets 39% of the vote against an incumbent governor who's under federal investigation at the time. And then we missed the opportunity, as Pat mentioned, to elect Bill, Bill Brady against the feckless Pat Quinn. And then Bruce Rauner comes over the top with money in 2014 against the most unpopular governor in the country at the time, and he wins. And great, now we have an opportunity to follow the model, and this is what the governor said he would do, follow the model that was set by Mitch Daniels in Indiana, by Scott Walker in Wisconsin, by Rick Snyder in Michigan. Well, that obviously didn't happen. And so the payons to unity, when always come, after the party has done the bidding of the other side. That's been the history for the last 50 years. Now it's time to unify, and you'll note that the unity is always around a cult of personality. It's always around this candidate or that candidate. There's never a conversation, much less the establishment of an agreement, as to what it is we're unifying around, except this individual for this election cycle. And then no matter what that individual does when in office, that we unify around him again, or we unify around somebody else that we've determined should be the nominee or the leader, regardless of what they say they are going to do, regardless of what they actually do when given the opportunity. And that's why we're the super minority party in this state. And that's why we're trending, Pat's right about this, we're trending towards California, where the Republican Party is a legal fiction. You think we have one party rule now, just wait the way this is going. And it's because the Republican Party, to borrow a Goldwaterism, offers an echo to what the Chicago Democrats have done. The, the, I mean, the joke that he started with, this is the greatest gathering of Republicans in Chicago since Lincoln got the nomination. Yeah, it's funny because it, there's rooted in truth. And that's a failure of the Republican Party for the last 50 years to compete in Chicago. We pretend, we pretend, we pretend that this three million person hamlet can just be ignored. And we can just run against it in the suburbs and downstate. We have a mayor running for his third term who's about as popular as Lyme disease, and we can't find a center-right candidate to run in 2011 against him, in 2015 against him, or now in 2019 against him. But we can be completely asleep at the switch while a fracking Nazi is nominated for the 5th Congressional District to run against Dan Lipinski. That is another failure of the Republican Party. I don't care how you cut it. I don't care how many nice op-eds you get from Richard Porter in the Tribune about how much we like Jews. It is obscene, obscene to have Art Jones represent our party and for any office. It's because we're asleep at the switch, because we care about whoever has money right now, because we care about whosever flag we have to rally around right now, and that's it. And there's no 
thinking, much less conversation, about elections as the means to policy ends. And oh, by the way, just to establish my bona fides for one minute, because I get criticism from both sides, and that's fine. I'm in the arena. It comes to the territory. But it's not like I'm some purist. I get, I've gotten criticized from conservatives throughout the years for the candidates I've chosen, the choices I've made. I ran Beth Colson's reelection three times. Beth Colson was one of the most moderate members of the House, but she never had a Republican primary. And my philosophy was in Glenview and Northbrook, a, somebody with a 100% rating with the NFIB was better than a Madigan roll call vote, even if I disagreed with her on a range of issues. So I supported Beth Colson with my PAC. Because you're going to hear, I'm sure, that, oh, you know, but it's endless purity tests. And Proft only supports uh, people who are like Proft or Tillman. It's nonsense. We've supported good candidates who disagree with us on a range of issues. Jonathan Greberg, when he ran against Elaine Neckwitz on the North Shore, he's for, he was for civil unions. I'm not. He was pro-choice. Ari Freeman is a great candidate, Navy uh, chopper pilot and a pediatrician, ran against Julie Morrison. He's pro-choice. He was for civil unions. I'm not. Bob Kelnicki, when he ran out Roger Clare's way against Natalie Manley for civil unions. So this idea that it's endlessly purity test is bunk. What it is, though, is a demand that there is something substantive that transcends any single individual and any single election cycle that unites the Republican Party to do something important if, God forbid, the people of this state ever gave us the reins of power. Why not? So, let me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me answer that. And, and I, you know, I've heard that speech a million times before. No, yeah, in the last, yes, I have. And, and the last time I heard it, it was the same stuff, and it's not a purity test, and, and anger, and spitting venom, and talking about how screwed up the party is, and how terrible we all are, and blah, 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 blah. But the reality is, Dan, and listen, everybody likes to listen to you, the people that listen to you on the radio, a lot less than they do on WGN, by the way. But the point is, all right, I'm just kidding. The point is, you've won nothing of significance. You've never flipped a seat. When you ran, you got 7%. You got creamed in the last cycle in 16 when you were playing ball with the rest of us. You had a great year. The point is, this is all good stuff. And you and I, this is not Bennett. We can have a debate. But I want to win elections. And you yeah, don't so win do elections. Well, the right, rhetoric so do like I, that I doesn't have. win elections. And so let me, let me uh, answer hold you. On one second. One of your hold 14 on one second. charges. Dan, hold on one second. Let me ask. Let's, let's try to move forward in this discussion. And I, and I realize there's history here. But, I, but I, let's see if we can. What I'd like to know from either one of you or both of you, what's a winning coalition for a Republican in the state of Illinois? And, and include in there what's the message for the Republican Party and how do we be successful either in this election or in the next few elections as a party? How do we come together, forgetting the past? We can learn from the past, but how do we, how do we move forward and be successful? What's the formula? To either one of you, or both of you. Dan, you go first. Yeah, the formula is simple. Uh, pick your head up and look around. It's all around us. OK, what? The Walker, Daniels, to some extent, Snyder model of governance. It's a conservative reform path. It is free minds, free markets, and a free society. It is to defend people who are culturally ridiculed by the Marxist left, and it's to advance the interests of entrepreneurs and job creators and productive people, as, while also, also maintaining the responsibility government has to the truly in need, like the developmentally disabled in the state, which we also do a terrible job of, oh, by the way, despite all the you know, high-minded talk from the uh, members of the political class of both parties. It's not that complicated, but when you open with surrender, which is what the Republican uh, caucuses have done for the last four years, including the governor, um, it's difficult to chart that path, and it's difficult to offer a distinction to the other side. And oh, by the way, since we're talking about uh, these races and winning elections, and that's what Pat wants to do, and I don't, let's see, six of eight primaries in 14, nine of 10 primaries in 16, uh, we were in 16 of the 21 races we were involved in in this cycle. And uh, Jim Durkin's floor leader right now, Peter Breen, was a candidate I supported when Jim Durkin supported incumbent Nandy, Sandy Pijos in Glen Ellen. So we can talk about elections. You want to go to the scoreboard? Let's go to the scoreboard and I'll we'll talk all day. Yeah, well, I don't want to do that all day, but I will tell you in 16, when you, got off, when you got off message and got off the party and started going on your own and doing the same thing that's, you're doing. That's not but, true. Can I, I'm going to no, finish. No, no, that's I'm not gonna, true. Yeah, it is true. It's Sam McCann, 16, we backed, we backed yeah. an opponent to Sam McCann, the primary, at the behest of the governor. Yeah, well, well you know, here's a, good, here's a good point that nobody really knows. And if you, I'm here to talk about winning elections. I don't 
don't want to have some big. Doesn't sound like you are. Well, yeah, I am. <laughs> have some have some big debate about Dan in the big words and all the. Uh, I don't even can't understand half the stuff you say. But the point is, the point I can is. See the point. The point is, yeah, I know you're a genius. In sixteen, in sixteen, there. Were, this is what Dan and Tillman and the rest of his crew that criticizes Republicans, criticizes Governor Rauner's very, very detailed agenda, which he didn't surrender on anything. If there's anything Brad Governor Rauner did wrong, he didn't surrender. Hey, wait, let me finish. Let, let, yeah, Jeannie, let finish. Ives, Jeannie Ives, two days before the primary, Jeannie Ives, and I got a lot of respect for Jeannie Ives, she said that she agreed with all of the governor's reform agenda. The only thing she didn't agree with is the uh, Trust Act and HB 40. So she agreed with the governor 95% of the time. Jim Durkin stopped 130 pieces of Madigan legislation since Governor Rauner has been governor. So to, to suggest that somehow we're a surrenderer of Republicans, that's just Dan's way of saying, if you don't agree with me, you're not a good Republican, which I get sick of hearing, and we shouldn't support you. We, we, listen, we can have, we can have no. very intellectually honest and sincere debates on both those issues and disagree but still be friends. But when you support 95% of the governor's agenda, like Dan used to until the governor wouldn't give him the money to run the races. That's not true. Yes, it it's is just, true. It's absurd. Well, it is true, Dan. It's you know absurd. That. You don't know what the hell you're talking yeah, about as per usual. Yeah. And let me tell you 95% something else. You want, of the races. About, you want to talk about issues? Let's talk about issues. Let's talk about it. Uh, you're wrong about Jeannie Ives as you're wrong about everything else because you don't do your homework. You just bloviate with Steve Cochran to a bunch of octogenarians on WGN. So go pound sand. Six of 73, six of 73 legislative Republicans. Six of 73 voted with the governor for sanctuary state. Six of 73 legislative Republicans, Jeannie Ives not one of them, voted for his transgender bathroom bill. Zero of 73 legislative Republicans voted for forced taxpayer funding of abortion all nine months of pregnancy, zero. Only 27, 27 of 73 Republic, legislative Republicans voted for the Exelon bailout, $2.5 billion bailout where Pat was lobbying for Exelon. Jeannie Ives voted against it, Ronner signed it. So it's about cultural issues, it's also about economic issues. And I guess those uh, 67 to 73 uh, 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 of the 73 legislative Republicans, they need to be drummed out of the party too, Pat, because they weren't with the governor and they weren't with you on those issues. No, I just think that the Republicans need to quit listening to this. I don't know what you're so angry about. Really. The, the numbers well, are the numbers. So, what do you because, no, no, because, what do you, I, because you, I'm sick of my have, party surrendering I, I, I to the know, other we can, side. We can I'm have sick of the state being the laughing stock in the country. I'm sorry you're not upset about it. I, I am, am upset, but you know, we're all on the same team, and the, the anger. Yo, I'm, not, I'm not on your team. You want me out of the party. No, I don't want you. I just want you to quit running campaigns because you're not very good at it. Right. And I wasting know. money. Right. That's all the right. point. You're, all right, hold on, hold on, hold on. We could go round and round and round again. That's all you've got. Let's go chapter and verse, buddy. All right, hold on. Chapter and verse. Hold on. For 20 years. We got about. I, we're going to have to, one, narrow the answers. I'm just going to start. And I, but look, I, and then I'm going to run, run down a number of questions I have. You both are passionate about where you are. And, and we have a number of people in this party that, that follow and, and believe in what you're saying, Dan. And a, 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 number, a good number of people feel the same way about where you are, Pat. How do we, without going back in history, how do we, moving forward, unify somehow this this division so we can elect, whether it's Bruce Rauner, Darlene Sanger, House seats, Senate seats, et cetera. How do we come together in some way to be successful? Pat? Now, now watch Dan's head explode here. We have. The only one that's not on board is Dan. I'm the, 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 party, the, party, the party has, the party, Tim Schneider has put, they reached a compromise after the election, recognizing the, the great gains that okay. Jeannie Ives made and put a conservative, very conservative Mark Shaw in a spot at the state party. And, and I think a, most Republicans want to win. Most Republicans don't want a progressive income tax increase. They want property tax relief. If we elect J.B. Pritzker, we're going to get all these things and more. They're talking about giving this progressive income tax increase. One of the proposals that's going on in Springfield right now is to, is to increase taxes on people making $17,000 a year. I think Republicans are united. My whole point with this discussion is we can't be angry, screaming, yelling all the time and expect anybody to vote for us. They just think we're mean. Um, yeah. Dan. Right. 
but, but we can expect to unify the party and uh, present an attractive offer when Pat is running around saying John Tillman, Dan Proft, everybody who disagrees with me is a hater, and, we, and, and, and just dismissing all of the policy concerns of the conservative base of the party and telling people to get out. I mean, if the parties unify, Pat, I, I'm sorry, I guess this lunch is dismissed because we have nothing to talk about. The party's unified. I'm the only holdout. I apologize for wasting everybody's time. Hey, that's good. good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything's nice. good. Go. <laughs> Everything's good. We are on our way to super majorities and Republican governors as far as the eye can see. And, and anybody who believes that, please, you're welcome to leave and get on with your day. Let's I, do my, it. No, 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 but my own point is, this is not how you win elections. Right. This is not how yeah. you appeal to support. Calling me a hater. No, Calling this, John no, Tillman no, a hater. Yeah, that's yeah, how you win elections. No, you know how you win. You don't win elections by putting up that, that transgender hate ad. You don't win elections like the Policy Institute by putting up that racist cartoon. You don't win elections by taking a stripper pole billboard and putting strippers for Durkin and run it in front of his high school, his daughter's high school, when the kids got out of school. That's how you don't win elections. I can argue with Dan all day and have a blast and walk out and have a couple beers. The point is, I want to win. I want to win elections. And listen, I'm every bit as conservative as Dan is. He is not the voice of the conservative. Yes, you are going to bet. You ask me any question on the, I'm every bit as conservative as Dan. I'm pro-life. How do you like that? Is that okay for you? Yeah. All right. All right. Hold on. Time out. Let's ask, I'm going to go down and do, do a couple questions. Well, the whole point of this, can I just say one thing? The whole point of this is like this is a binary between me and Pat. It's not a binary between me and Pat. Hate me, love me, hate Pat, love Pat. Who cares? The, the, the tra it's the trajectory of the party. What kind of Republican party do you want to be a part of? What kind of state do you want to live in? It's your call. It's not my call. And it's not Pat's call. All right. All we can do is present options. All right. Short answers. I got. Look at all these things. Here we go. Why is the level of civility in this country, not just in Illinois, but in this country, it's such a low level, Pat? And, I'm, and, I, and, I, and I, I know they've, they've gone back and forth, and, I know, and it's not yeah, I don't even mind. Listen, I don't mind going. It, it going. is at a low level. Why? Yeah, no, I, you know, I, people, I think, talk about that too much. I don't mind having arguments with Dan on anything. And I think it's, it's healthy, and it's part of the process. But to me, it's a matter of, of respect. And the things I was talking about before that came out of the Policy Institute and Dan's campaigns, those are disrespectful. And when you put up a transgender hate ad like that, it, it goes. Hate. Was, well, yeah, in my well, opinion, I disagree. What, well, that's fine. That's, that's good. Right. That's why we're here. Let me finish. But the point is, when you do that stuff, you not only lose the people. Jeannie Ives probably could have come close to winning that race had she not done that ad. She lost the trip endorsement could have, on it. Could have come close. No, I mean, she come close. 18,000 votes. Well, whatever. But I'm, I'm saying that she might, maybe she could have won it, but she would have had endorsements. And people that were willing to yeah. give her a look because they're unhappy with the governor, obviously, some of the people here might have given her a second look. But you put this, this hate ad up, or you put that, that racist ad that the IPI put up, or even what you did to. To, to Jim Durkin, where you're spending 2.1 million in a race that never got within 30 points. I mean, that, that's not how you win. It's just stupid. It's not good campaigning, yeah. and, and people don't like it, and they turn off. So Dan, that's why. That's, well, civility. That, that's uh, from someone who's uh, been around campaigns but hasn't run campaigns. Um, the, the ad that Jeannie Ives did, uh, that we did on that campaign, is the only reason she had a chance to win at the end. That's, that's the fact of campaigns. And if you talk to actual operatives, um, they'll largely tell you the same thing. We are going to, you don't win races. I, you know, with all due respect to John and Kristen, you don't win races, Republican primaries or races in general, banking on the Chicago Tribune editorial board. I'm sorry, they just don't carry that much weight. This is a money game and a, and a pierce the veil game when it comes to running insurgent campaigns against a guy with $100 million who's been governor for three years and $50 million in the bank. I hate to break it to people, but that's how it actually works. So you're but proud of that, Ed? All right, Dan. No, let me, Dan, let me ask yeah, you. It, was, that, it was an illustration of policy choices the governor made. That's what it was. President, President Trump, good or bad for us as we move into the fall election? Dan? Uh, President Trump, good or for? Good or bad for our Republican Party here in Illinois as we go into the election in Look, I, I think November? Look, I think he'll be uneven around the state if you're thinking about legislative races. I think that he still has a lot of popularity uh, downstate. I think he has popularity in pockets in suburban districts that are winnable. Um, so it's, it's going to be something where you've got to localize of these races, nationalize them to some extent about the prospect of a Nancy Pelosi takeover, the way that uh, Democrats were able to do to us in 96 when they took away the majority by nationalizing or by localizing Newt Gingrich and making some of these legislative races national races. That's, that's one option that we have. So I think it's really mixed, but I don't think you run from Trump. I think you say, look, he's the President of the United States, he's a member of the General Assembly, just as a statewide elected official. We need to do everything we can to work with the President to derive the benefits to Illinois from the federal government. And then you pivot and you talk about races that are local here, like property taxes. Pam Brady. I, uh, 
I, I agree completely. All right, we're done. He, he just said he agreed with him completely. I think we stop on that note, a high note. All right, next question. This is from Rebecca Shi, Illinois Business Immigration Coalition. Why is the Republican Party opposed to legislation, legislation, legislation that could support hospitality and agricultural industries, agriculture industries? Pat Brady? I, I don't what? know any specifics that are. I don't. What's the legislation? Yeah, I don't know. I, well, uh, could be DACA, anything dealing with immigration. I apologize. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, sorry I said immigration. Yeah. I, didn't, I was not specific. It, just immigration in general, Pat, if you want to. Seem to have yeah, some that, that's, that's another one of these issues that I think um, uh, the far right of the party uh, gets it wrong and, and costs us elections because they just take two, and the president with the wall. I mean, the, the two, my two greatest idols as a, um, elected officials and, and thought leaders are Ronald Reagan and Jack Kemp, who both took very, would, would be seen by the right, liberal positions on immigration. I worked the border when I was in the U.S. Attorney's Office in San Diego, and it's a problem, but we need to secure the border. We have 16 million people here that we can't, we don't have 16 million pair of handcuffs. But we can't demonize everybody that's here and call them rapists and murderers and the things like the president does. We need to, to figure out a that's problem. Not, that's not what he's saying. That's not what he's saying. But it, it also, is, in, 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 in this state, in the state, it's, it's, it's interesting. I, I travel a lot of the state, and I've probably been to every county. Downstate, the immigration issue is really, really big because that's becoming an economic blight down there uh, as, as you go further from south to, to north. And it's a big, big issue down there. But I think the tone that the Republicans need to set is, hey, we get it, we have a problem, we want to fix it, but we're not going to be mean-spirited about it and take kids that have been, we're, we're just by virtue of being born here, uh, are, we're going to throw them back or do something bad to them. But it is a, there's some people in the room that have worked on the issue, and I think if we strike the right balance, we win more votes that way. Well, we shouldn't, and, yeah, one of, one of the things we shouldn't do as Republicans, one of the things we shouldn't do is uh, repeat the left's talking points, mischaracterizing what guys on our side say. That's number one. Number two is it's the rule of law issue. I'm a pro-immigrant conservative, as most conservatives are. People who want to come to this country to build a better life for themselves, uh, add value to this country, super fantastic. I don't believe in caps. I don't believe in any of it. I also don't believe in the welfare state. So there's where there's the rub, and there's the where you have to drive a compromise. But uh, so a deal on DACA, the president came over the top on Democrats for a deal on DACA. I'll see your 800,000, and I'll raise you to 1.8 million. But you got to do something on border security. The left doesn't want to do border security, and you still have some never Trump Republicans like Pat running around denigrating the president. It's ridiculous. We can be a pro-immigration party as well as a rule of law party. The two are not mutually exclusive. One of the next, uh, one of the, uh, one of the other big races besides the governor, not that they're all important, uh, is the AG race. A uh, new candidate uh, on the Republican side, Erica Harold. Thoughts on that race, Pat Brady? Uh, I spent a lot of time with Erica Harold, and I was a prosecutor myself for 10 years, and she might be the finest candidate I've ever seen. She is uh, Harvard educated. Uh, African-American uh, uh, who went to the University of Illinois, got a scholarship um, to go to Harvard because she be became Miss USA. I, I took her to a big event out in King County a couple months ago, and it was just amazing to watch her, the, the poise and maturity. I've known her for a while because we were, uh, she ran downstate um, two or three cycles ago. And to see people figure out who she, she was, and she's truly got star power, not just in the way she looks, but the way she carries herself, and then people figure out that she's the former Miss USA, and she handles it so well. She's so mature, so poised, and she's the most thoughtful candidate I've ever seen. There was a, some issue came up a couple weeks ago where it, would have been, it was a knee-jerk reaction by her opponent. Erica sat out for 24 hours, read the law, and gave an absolutely perfect response. So as we go forward, I want to talk about the party. If you want to build a party around somebody that could go all the way to the top and appeal to a lot of people that we don't appeal to right now, Erica Harold's your candidate. Dan. Uh, yeah, I've actually known Erica since the 2002 gubernatorial campaign of Pat O'Malley, where she was an intern when I was the comm director. So I've known her for that was so before she won Miss America. So I've known her a long time. She is uh, super, super sharp. She is a true, real deal Christian. She is not somebody who just talks it. She walks it. That's how she's lived her life. She would be a, a fantastic attorney general. She's a fantastic human being. I agree with Pat that she has the potential to be a party leader someday. And the real question we should be asking about down ballot candidates like Erica and legislative candidates is not the Trump effect, but the Rauner effect. Yeah, that, that's just not true. I know it's a talking point for the WIND, but it's just not true. I've, I've seen the numbers. 
uh, J.B. Pritzker doesn't poll as well as everybody think he does. And actually, Governor Rauner polls a lot better. And I think we kind of turned the corner last week with the way he handled the, the gun issue. So I, people want to give up on Governor Rauner. We've got a long way to go. And a lot of the things he's done, 80% of what the governor, 70% of what the governor does, most people don't hear about. And a lot of the reforms that he's made within the operations of state government, including who gets access to meetings and who gets into the RFP process and the rest of it, Governor Rauner's done a great job of cleaning up. So as this campaign unfolds, you're going to hear a lot more about what he has done. And I don't think he's going to be a drag on any part of the ticket. So real quick, uh, this should be a quick one. Besides Erica, who are the future of the Republican Party farm team? Who do you, who do you see coming up? Tom Demmer is going to be president of the United States one of these days. Uh, we have a lot of good young people. Dan recruited some of them. We have Nick Sauer, Avery Bourne in the House, Jason Berrickman in the Senate. A lot of good, young, talented people that really want to, want to do the right things. I'm leaving people out there, but I apologize. But we have a very good group uh, of young people that are committed public servants. Dan? Yeah, um, we do have some conservative backbenchers that uh, I think have a lot of upside potential. Um, nobody that Pat named, but um, uh, but because they actually got elected, that's right. Oh I'm no, I'm, yeah. I'm, oh, oh, sorry. I'm, I'm talking about incumbents <laughs> like Peter Breen. And yeah, Mark, good guy, great and Mark, guy, and Mark Batnick. So I am talking yeah. actually about incumbents. People got elected. You, you know what, Peter uh, Breen. I, Peter Breen, you couldn't get anybody better. Peter done. Breen is a is a yeah. quality you're human. You're being. welcome. Since I had a but run, that, run but, him against Durkin. But that's back yeah. when you were working with us, not against no. us. Yeah. No, I, right. no, okay. I was yeah. working against you because Durkin okay. supported Sandy Pios. You forget. No. You don't know your history. Yeah, I do know. Check my your D2s. Yeah, I will. I will. Yeah, All check right. your D2s. Uh, so Peter Breen, Mark Batnick, Keith Wheeler, uh, Randy Fries, Don State Quincy. Uh, this guy who's going to be uh, replacing Reggie Phillips uh, in Charleston area, Chris Miller, is a standout guy. So, you know, there's, there's a good 15 to 20 conservative reform types that I think want to put their principles into policy action in the House and the Senate, but that's not enough. Here's a question from Ed Backrack. In 1995, the Republican governor and legislature made Chicago municipal elections nonpartisan. How did this help Republicans in Chicago? How did it help Republicans that's in Chicago? That's the question. I just, that's it from, didn't help Republicans didn't help in Chicago. It absolutely didn't help Republicans in Chicago. Uh, and, you know, the, making it nonpartisan hurt, but it's, it's overcomable. Uh, and the first thing you need to do is, you know, nominate somebody who believes in center-right policies. And again, we haven't had a, a serious adult center-right candidate for mayor of Chicago since Don Hader in 1987. And that is an indictment of the Republican Party. I don't care how you cut it. And oh, by the way, just one point of order, you know, as much of a problem as I apparently am uh, to the you know, established order of things and how things are supposed to work smoothly in this state, I've never had a party title. As Pat said, I'm, you know, I'm basically irrelevant. So no, you've never I, been. I no, 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 no. You've never been elected to anything. I know. That's that's. I haven't been saying. elected to anything. Yeah, I, I haven't had a party title. What, what, why are you worried about me? You guys got it. No, no, you got no, it all no, handled. No, no, don't no, no. Sweat no, me, no, man. No, no. You got it all figured out. No, we don't have it all figured out. But you do. But you're the only one that's not. We, we, we've got. Who cares through, what I think? I don't. But I we've know. Gotten through so the, who cares? We've got. So why are you worried about me? We've got. Why you obsess about me on GN? I, I don't care. I don't think I've ever mentioned your name on WG. You mentioned it 15 times on election oh, night. Election. Ask anybody in the crowd. That's right, because you had such a miserable night, and and what? So after you do care about me? No, because I know my point. Well, no. which is it? My point is, do you care I, about me or not care about me? Am I relevant or not relevant? You know, deep down, I love you, Dan. You and I played a lot of golf together. I but don't the, go my, that way. my my point is, my point, my point is, you listen to this stuff, we lose. This is, not, this is not our winning coalition. We can't be angry far right. These guys have cracked the code on the winning coalition. No. Can't you see it all around you? Dan, when you ran the same thing. Are you tired of winning in Illinois? In, in, in 2010, you did this. I heard the same message downstate. You got seven, you got last place with the angry far, this state Jim. in the city of Chicago, you can't, Jim. a center right candidate's not Jim. gonna win. It's not a center right state. It's a center state at best. So you gotta be smarter than the talking So we points. need to recruit Tom, your buddy Tom Dart to run as a Republican. Or what, what is it we need to do in Chicago? Why don't we do anything in Chicago? You were state party chairman for four years, what'd you do? Because you gotta be smart and focus your resources. What'd you do? Where you can, I did a lot in 2010, we had the best year and raised more money than anybody. But in Chicago? Yeah, you actually, what, you raised money for yourself, but you've never raised money for the party. The point is, you gotta, you gotta, I, 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 you gotta, I spent $50 million of other people's money on other candidates in the last six years. What the hell are you talking about? I know, you didn't write. Knucklehead. Right. Yeah. You yeah. know what the fuck All you're right. talking about. Hold on, hold this on. This what I'm talking about. Now that hold right on, here, right there, on. that swearing, that oh, Oh my God, oh, oh heavens, oh. You, dro right. you drop an oh, F-bomb at the city. Here. I have another question. 
I have another question. You, you wanna, should I tell them the stories you tell me on the golf course? Let's, or are we just going to pretend one Pat Brady in public and another? Let's another go Pat with Brady. this question. Hold on. Hey, you got to you 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 get anger, man. I'll grab a drink with you. Let's, let's take it All down right. a notch. All right, no, hold let's on. Not. Hold on. Let's take it outside. Here's How about a, that? Hey. I think we have about one Whoa, or two more uh, questions, right? We're about done? Yeah. All right, here's, here's a question from Richard Porter. If you're, both in the, if you're both in the back of Tom's family station wagon, <laughs> this is pretty good, Richard, and could tell his dad to go to a his historical site to make a point to the other, where would you go and why? Wait, what? Huh? <laughs> this is a good question. If you're in the back of the station wagon, it can be anybody's, and uh, you were going to go to an historical site to make a point to the other, where would you go and why? You guys want a couple seconds? No, I'd go to, I'd drive them to Washington, D.C., and I'd do it at night, and I'd put them in front of the uh, Lincoln Memorial, and I'd have them read the Gettysburg Address, and I'd have them read Lincoln's uh, second inauguration. That pretty much, the Gettysburg Address is the best speech ever written. Every word means something if you care about the country, if you care about the Republican Party, if you care about anything. If you read that address, you can't be taken by just every word and how important it is. Good answer. Are we done? Uh, I'd uh, take him to the Lincoln Library in Springfield before we have to sell it. And, um, and uh, I would point him actually to a, a, a address that's much less known, but just as important as the Gettysburg Address, and that's the address that Lincoln gave at Cooper's Union where he made the case to take the country to war over slavery. That's one of the most important addresses because the point that he made is uh, you have to understand what the South wants. Don't believe the lie that the South will let us be non-slave while they're slave. Just leave us alone, the South says, but that's not true. The South will not stop until they take us over and make us slave states. The South will not stop until they uh, get us to, to say what we believe to, a, to, to be a morally evil is morally correct. They will never stop. And some, for some reason, we don't understand in this party, particularly in this state, that the left will never stop until they conquer us. You know, we're, we're and that's a great. The, the thing about all this discussion and the rancor and whatever, it, it's, I'm, we're all big people, we can handle it. But you know, the Republican Party in Illinois traces directly to Abraham Lincoln. We can do better. We should be the party that wants to do good things and help people and not be angry people we want to be people that help people have a good message and live, live according to our ideals. But why don't we, I think we need to look more to Lincoln and Reagan than we do to the Sean Hannity show. I mean, that, I think that's where we are in this country, and that's where the party is, yeah. is going. We, well, just, I, I think we also need to look to the party platform. And if this is going to be the, uh, an, an expression of the principles and the policies that we believe in and will advance, then we either hew to them or change them. But stop lying to ourselves and lying to other people when we don't abide our own statement of principles. That's a big problem, too. Uh, in terms of helping people, again, the greatest failure in Illinois has nothing to do with tax and spend policy. It has to do with the fact there are 22,000 families on the puns list urgent need of services for developmentally disabled person. And Republican governors and Democrat legislators and Democrat governors and Republican uh, legislators have all failed those families who truly need state services through no fault of their own. That's how barbaric Illinois has become. That's what a disgrace it is. It's an indictment of both parties. And nobody who's won an election uh, gets away without culpability for it. Hey, I completely agree. I completely agree. But do you think it's going to be any better with J.B. Pritzker? Do you really think giving Mike Madigan the complete keys to the kingdom is going to be better? We can have, again, we can have policy debates all day long. I want to win the election, and we don't win the election unless everybody in this room, whether you like me or hate me or like Dan or hate Dan, gets together to win this. Otherwise, it's going to be J.B. Pritzker, and it's going to be tax increases. None of the stuff, Dan, that you care about, that I care about, is going to get done. He's going to pay lip service to all these issues. No pension reform, no tax relief. None of the 45, 44 things the governor ran on are going to get done. We need to be unified. That's how we Three work. quick questions. Why, is, uh, why don't we have a Republican candidate for mayor in the city of Chicago? From either, from either kind of wing, if you will. Well, I mean, because sensible people look at this and say, well, if I were to even consider this, I'm a successful person in the city of Chicago. If I were even to consider this, what kind of support is available? What is the point of this? I don't see any infrastructure. I don't see any interest. Uh, I, I don't see any path. 
So why would a sensible person who has other options in their life do that? Failure of the Republican Party. We need good people to step up, but when they do step up, there needs to be somebody there that's going to help them. And the Republican Party abdicated the city of Chicago a long time ago, much to our detriment, and we continue to suffer from that abdication. But you have to start Restart, I guess. I, I would ask. To, right. Well, so that's, you have but to build that's wrong. That's again. That's it's easy to you say. To it's great that Dan could have been mayor, but the reality is he, he could never have won. We you just can't what win. What are you talking about? I'm not, you talk, talk, I'm not talking yeah, about you. Yeah, you told everybody for, for two years or three years you're going to run for mayor. The I'm reality not, is we're about. not going to win with a candidate, a, a far right candidate. I'm not, not going to. I'm not running for mayor. I know, but you be, you, <laughs> you intimate that to everybody. Like, why would a guy? Why would a guy like me do it when I don't have support? You couldn't do it because you couldn't win. Let's be realistic. If we want to be smart about it, I can see that I cannot win the mayorship. Right. of Chicago. Right. Now, but, but, but somebody you, else could. You lead people on like, why would a guy like me? Sure, Dan. The point is we need to re rebuild the, uh, we need to rebuild the, uh, the uh, township structures. When we really started getting in trouble 20 years ago with the party, we lost the township structures. That's why we lost so much influence in, in Cook County. This, the city, don't waste your time where you can't win. All right. Well, okay. Well, but, but that's the attitude that where we got swept out of the south suburbs in 1996, and I was there. We never returned. When we got swept out of the North Shore in the late 80s to the mid 90s, we never returned. I was there. So this, this kind of, the, the other side is an aggressor and is pushing, like oil spot technique, pushing out to its outer edges to continue to expand its empire. That's how they got Jack Franks for 15 years in McHenry County. That's how they have uh, uh, Pat Brady's good friend, Tom Cullerton, in eastern DuPage County, where it should be Republican. So if we just continue to say, if you defeat us, then we'll, uh, we'll cede the territory to you. That's how you shrink to this position we are now, where you have no margin for error to try to get to a majority. Two quick it's questions. Just, it's just not smart. Two it's quick just, questions. I mean, that Paul Ryan's was in like, last week, and their strategy is concentrate nationally on the, on the elections you can win. And it's great. It's, they're great sound bites. It's just not smart. And if you've got limited resources, you put them where you can win. This Two, isn't a one election cycle proposition, obviously. All right, but two if questions. we never start to build the infrastructure that could bear fruit two and right. three cycles We down have the two road. quick questions and we're done. This, this should take one answer, one word from, you, from both of you. What state with a similar population and demographic makeup, this is from Alexander Brunk, can you point to where the state Republican Party has been successful recently in winning both, in both winning elections and enacting policies? What can we learn from... We're not gonna, we only, I have, what state? We're not going to ask the next question. Uh, Massachusetts and Delaware. Dan? Florida. No, that's not a blue state. No, he said what state that's demographically like Illinois? Said, yeah, similar population of, demographic. In terms of population size, uh, racial, ethnic diversity? Florida. Oh, and by the way, they have no income taxes, still have lower property taxes than us. Last question, sure last question from Tom Donovan. You kind of hit, hit on this on the impact of Trump, but his question is a little different. I think it's a good one. President Trump is getting more popular every day in spite of media opposition. Why can't, don't Republicans get behind him and get together? This is Tom Donovan's final question. I think Republicans do get behind him when he does. Uh, the, my issues with Trump was he wasn't a conservative. And he ran, the platform he ran on the isolationism, the, 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 the tariffs and all thing he ran for president, he just wasn't a conservative. He's done some things I think actually great, the, the tax reform bill, the position that Pompeo just put out on Iran. Uh, I, I think I like the way he's handled North Korea, uh, the, the regulatory rollbacks. He's done a lot of things, and I think we should get behind him for that. But there are other things, and he's his own worst enemy, uh, that get in the way, and then they hurt the rest of the party uh, down ticket. But I, I think a lot of Republicans, including me, who I was not a never Trumper, I just didn't like the guy at the time the convention came around. I got on board, but, and we need to support him for those things that are within our conservative bandwidth. But when he ran, he was not a conservative. Dan? That's fascinating. So. Um, President Trump can be criticized when he uh, veers from conservative, uh, conservative policy positions, but Ronner cannot. This is so interesting. The, who, gets to, who gets which passes? That's so, so interesting here. One of the things that we need to do, as I said, is embrace the uh, momentum that President Trump has from the conservative grassroots and populists who despise the ruling class, because we've got a really despicable ruling class in this state, and they should channel that. And, and doing things like we're done uh, most recently with members of the House Republican Caucus uh, signing on and some refusing to not oppose a resolution objecting to Trump's infrastructure plan, that's not very sensible. But this is what happens when you have a Republican Party where it's every man for himself. 
and there's no leadership, and there's no structure, and there's no organizing principles. That's what you have. You have a Republican Party that is in the super minority and will continue to be until they decide to chart a different course. It is, this is the choice going into 2018 and beyond. It is either going to be oblivion, California style, or it's going to be conservative reform and a resurgence like the rest of our Midwestern states. That's the choice. And, and embracing Trump's kind of neoconservative populist coalition is going to be part of that. You know, it's, it's so interesting to listen to that. I, that. You really think that if Bruce Rauner wins, there's all of a sudden this state's going to go from being center or center left at best to a far right state that's going to support the kind of rhetoric that you put out. It's just fantasy camp. It's a good way to raise money. I, I said nothing that. of the sort. Yeah, well, that's what you're saying. It's a strong man argument. It's going to be a resurrection. It, it, no, to me, it's just kind of nonsense. Let's deal on the realities of what, what we got here. What, We're West, a center left Wisconsin. state. Wisconsin. All right. We're done. Uh, you both. So, so thank you both very, very much. I didn't get all your questions. I'm going to go get a milkshake.